Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, uh, as always, to worship you. This is something we do every week, and something we do, uh, should be doing it every weekday, but we come and we gather today because this day is sacred to you. Uh, you have set it aside as holy for your name's sake. We pray that we would treat it with the holiness and the regard uh, that you have for it, that we would focus on you. But Lord, we also know that worshiping you can also be fun. And so I pray that you would bring us together and you would give us this, this joy to worship you the way that you have created us to be. In your name we pray. Amen. Now I believe Judy is not here this morning, so if you will please... We have the call to worship. And so here we stand and we'll sing the call to worship. Oh, 
And so I, I want to start by wishing you all the best this Memorial Day. Uh, Memorial Day is a national holiday where we get to honor our fallen soldiers. Uh, past and even present, uh, we want to honor our fallen soldiers who have uh, given their lives so that we can live uh, securely, so that we can do things like going to the lake and uh, enjoying the, the freedom we have given. We can go to the beach, we can go for a lot, but we want to make sure that we stop and we remember them and we give them the honor that is, is due to them. I reflect on just, it, this is off the cuff, but it, it just, the thing that has been going through my head all, all morning and as I've been preparing this message all week, I, I sit and I think and go, we honor them for their life that they have laid down for us. And we do this one day out of the year. But really, by living our life, this is the way that we honor them because that is our life that they have secured for us. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things that, that kind of can be caught up in that. Uh, a lot of feelings or, you know, maybe perhaps it, it's complicated. But really, truly, when you get down to it, the, the brass tacks is just that they have lived their way given their life so that we can live ours. And so the, the appropriate reflection this morning is to, to honor them. And so I, I think about Memorial Day and I've been asking myself the question, what is the importance of setting up a memorial? Why do we set up anything for a memorial? And so we, we've set aside this day, but we think of memorial, it, it, it's in the name. Memory all. Memory. It's from the root word memory. Uh, it is something physical that we look at and see that causes us to remember. It brings things back to our memory. We have public memorials. We have statues in the park because, oh, you see it and you remember something. But we also have uh, pictures on the wall. Uh, even as you enter this sanctuary, there's a picture on the wall. There, there's pictures over there uh, in the fellowship hall of what this church has done. And this is a memorial to remember the congregation and the church here. You have scrapbooks, yearbooks, souvenirs. When you go on a trip, you, you bring back a souvenir. Why? Because you want to remember the trip. It's something that will spark your memory and go, oh, that. In fact, there are people's houses that I guarantee you can walk in, you can walk all around the house and you can go, oh, well, what's this? Oh, well, this is a memory of the time we did this, the time we did that, and the time this happened. And so we have, we, we live in a culture that is surrounded by, by memorials. In fact, it's very fascinating that literally right now we are sitting in Stephen Green Memorial Baptist Church. The family of Stephen Green who was the owner of the textile mill, offered the money, after he passed, they offered the money to build this building for the Second Baptist Church of Winsboro. And they said, we will give you the money to build this building that we are sitting in right now if you will just memorialize the church after him. Because he started a Bible study in the textile mill. He had a habit of doing this in every mill that he owned. He would go in and start a Bible study with the mill workers. And so they said, all right, this Bible study grew into a church. And so we see this, this building we are sitting in as a memorial to this great benefactor and to the work of the Lord in this textile mill in Winsboro, in the Mill Village. To some of you, this building is not so much a memorial to the benefactor as it is a memorial to the Mill Village. It's been standing here the entire time, right? Your entire lives. Even people who don't go to this church, that's been here. We know what that is. So the building itself is a memorial. In fact, next year, we get to celebrate 
the 100th anniversary of this building. The church has been around for 120 years, but next year, 100 years, this building has been standing. It's on the cornerstone that day. Memorials are everywhere we look. In the past few years, our society has had a controversy coming up about certain memorials. Is this meant to, to stand up or, you know, are we tearing down statues? Does this need to be in the public square? Do we need this out there? And the real question that they are asking is, what do you want to remember? Because, all right, you might have something in the public square that you don't like, but what was the purpose of the person putting that up? That's the real question we ask. What, was, why did, what did they want us to remember from this memorial being established? Because it's to bring back memory. Why did they want successive generations to learn and remember from it? And so that is the question we want to address in this passage today. And so when we open up the book of Joshua, the book of Joshua opens up and Joshua is Moses' right-hand man. He is, one of the, he is one of the two spies that came back from the initial uh, sending off into Israel, into the land of the promised land, and he's one of two that came back and gave a good report, him and Caleb. And consequently, he is one of only two people that came out of Egypt that gets to see the promised land with his own two eyes. And so the book opens with Joshua all of a sudden thrust into a leadership position. It, it, it is just thrown upon him because after wandering in the desert for 40 years, Moses has now died, and Joshua, the whole nation, is looking at Joshua to take up the reins. He is tasked with leading the new generation into the promised land of Canaan. Now, they were wandering for 40 years because the previous generation would not go into the land. And so it's, it's very important what is happening right now. Even under Moses' leadership, the greatest leader that we have seen on the face of this planet, they couldn't enter. He couldn't get them to do it. And Joshua is now going, oh, now this is my job. They have been told that from the moment that they enter the land, they will have to fight many battles once they enter to take over the land. But before they can do any of that, they have this problem of crossing the river. They have to cross the Jordan River. And so they come up to this river and, oh, you know, it, it, it's not a fast-moving stream, the Jordan River. But they arrive at it and is at flood stage. The whole river is flooded on its banks. And they have to get millions of people, the entire nation worth of people, over this river. God instructs Joshua to have the priests step into the river. This is Joshua chapter 3. He, has the, he instructs them to step into the river with the Ark of the Covenant. And so before anybody goes, they take the Ark of the Covenant and they step into the river. And all of a sudden the water recedes. The moment they're ankle deep, the water recedes. And chapter 3 ends with the river entirely dried up because it says the water had piled up at a city called Adam. When The interesting thing about this is that the terminology piled up is, is similar terminology to the way it was at the Red Sea in the Exodus. The water piled up on both sides. But here the water piled up near a city called Adam. I did some research and looked at where the city is, and it's about 20 miles north upstream. The water piled up 20 miles away. Now, I don't know how they knew that, but <laughs> you have millions of people. Maybe they stretched 20 miles up north. But for those who know this story, this is Im conjuring images of the water in the Red Sea piling up. And so per the previous generation that would not go into the land, they went through the Red Sea. And now this generation is seeing a similar thing happen with the waters of the Jordan River. At flood stage, it is now dry land that they are walking across. And so this is where the Lord tells Joshua to make a memorial. Once the whole nation had started, had almost finished crossing, the Lord tells Joshua, starting in chapter 4, verse 1, 
Now when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you, and lay them down at the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, Because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. And so we look at the reasons for having a memorial. Well, the first reason is that memorials make us remember the past. What was the whole reason that the Lord said, I want this memorial to be built up. So the whole nation crosses the river. The Lord tells Joshua to get 12 men, one representative from each tribe. And these representatives are going to each go into the river, pick up a stone, which we assume they have to carry it on their shoulders so it's not too big, but it ain't small. And they're going to carry it off to their next camp. And they're going to build a memorial at their next camp. And what is the purpose? Well, the assumption is that when they build this memorial, one day their children would see it. And there will be this question, what do these stones mean to you? It's a very interesting question because it's a subjective question. What's it mean to you? Well, is that different from what it means to the next guy or the next girl? The assumption is that one day the children would see it and start asking questions about it. What's this? What's this? There's also an assumption that in order for them to ask what's this, and remember you have an entire nation, that these children would be someday come across this thing. And so they would be intentionally led to it, to learn from it. Which tells me that we need to intentionally take our children places so that they will see things so that they can remember the history that we have built. It is a natural tool to teach history to a new generation. Because if you see something weird, you're going to start asking questions about it, right? This is out of place. This doesn't make sense. What is this? It says, when your children ask you about it, you will have a response. This is what the Lord did. He led us across on dry ground. Memorials tell us, remember this event. This thing actually happened. This is not a myth. This happened. And we think about it. These stones were taken out of the river by the priests and carried with them to their next destination. The next camp is not by the river. You have river stones on dry land. My wife uh, asked the question. Now, now this is for the geology nerds and the geeks out there, if you really want to nerd out. Uh, Israel has a great variety of rock because it is such a vast, like the landscape there changes so rapidly in such a small, short amount of space. And so they've got so many different types of rock there. And Israel is, you know, like, this is not true, but I don't know the statistic, but Israel is like almost 90% rock. The whole thing is just one rock to another rock. That's, that's why they don't plant a lot of crops there. It's because there's a rock in your field. But my wife asked the question, did the stones from the river look like a different rock from the place where they camped? Well, we opened a geology book and looked at it and went, probably. You have river stones that are put in a mountainous region because they camped at Gilgal. And so what is the point there? This sticks out. This memorial, you look at it and you go, that does not belong here. 
these things do not belong here. They were taken out of the river. How do you get river stones in the mountains? You don't. And so the children would say, what's that? And if we're honest with ourselves, why do we know that, why do memorials exist? What is the purpose for them? Well, memorials exist because we forget. You wouldn't have to have something that reminds you of something if you didn't forget it happened in the first place. Humans naturally forget things. This is the reason we have calendars, write sticky notes, <laughs> set reminders on our phone, and then all of a sudden we're surprised when the date comes up and we go, we're here already? I can't tell you how many times I've had to reset the passwords on my computer because I couldn't remember what I changed it to the last time. I mean, that's probably up in the hundreds. You ever forgotten your keys? You ever been locked out of your house because you forgot your keys? We forget. It's right there in the name, Memorial Day. We wouldn't need a day to remember if we weren't in danger of forgetting. And so memorials make us remember the past. What well, is another reason for having memorials? Well, rem memorials remind us of duty. Joshua 4, verse 8. Thus the sons of Israel did as Joshua commanded, took the 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, just as the Lord spoke to Joshua, according to the numbers of the tribes of the sons of Israel. And they carried them over with them to the lodging place and put them down there. Then Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing. And they are there to this day. For the priests who carried the Ark were standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was completed that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people. According to all that Moses had commanded Joshua, and the people hurried and crossed. And when all the people had finished crossing, the ark of the Lord and the priests crossed before the people. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh crossed over in battle array before the sons of Israel, just as Moses had spoken to them. About 40,000 equipped for war crossed the battle for battle before the Lord to the desert plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel so that they revered him just as they had revered Moses all the days of his life. This section might seem like a throwaway section. We turn our brain off and go, all right, that's a bunch of statistics. I don't really know all that. There's a lot happening here. First of all, we see that Joshua sets up another memorial in the middle of the river where the feet of the priests were standing. Some scholars debate this, but I read this and I go, it sounds like they had already carried the stones for the first memorial off, and Joshua decides right there in the middle of the river to build another one. Because it says it is still there to this day. Now, we don't know exactly when Joshua was written, but it's very likely at least one generation later, maybe possibly two or three, maybe even down to the time of the judges or King David. They're sitting there saying, this memorial still stands. And guess what? It's in the middle of the river. How do you get a memorial in the middle of the river? Well, there's only one way. At one point, you were in the middle of the river. How amazing is it that having a memorial in a place where it should not be all of a sudden proves that God is miraculous? Anytime somebody looks at that and says, well, how'd that get there? That's not something that is very easy to do. How did that get there? Well, they said at some point God dried up the river and the people crossed on dry land and Joshua built this memorial. Oh, well, that explains it. People don't believe miracles unless they can tangibly see them. <laughs> and here Joshua is saying, no, 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 no. I want to prove to these generations that are coming that this actually happened. This is not a myth. This is not your, your parents telling old fables. This happened, and I can prove it. Look at that. How did that structure get in the river except for that God dried it up so that they could cross? 
I'm struck by the brilliance of Joshua in this moment. But there's also, he has a reminder that God is doing his duty. God did what he promised. That is a sense of duty. Joshua is honoring God by saying, no, 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 I want you to know that God did what he said he would. But then we see that throughout this entire section of scripture, it feels a little re- repetitious because the Lord says something and then Joshua does it. But what that is trying to teach us, anytime you see re- repetition in scripture where it says the Lord said something and it says the, almost the exact same thing again, it's showing you that the person was obedient. They're, o- they're obedient to what the Lord said that they would do. And so it's, it's not just repeating itself because it's repeating itself. It's doing that on purpose to show us this person did what they said they were going to do. And so we see that Joshua is obeying the Lord. The priests are performing their duties in public display of obedience to God. Joshua is fulfilling his role as leader by obeying what the Lord and Moses told him to do before Moses died. And so where the previous generation was disobedient and said, we are not going into the land, Joshua is sitting here saying, guess what? We are going into the land and I need to mark this occasion because we've been wandering in the desert for 40 years. I'm one of two people that made it out of Egypt and gets to see this. And this is glorious. We see scripture takes great care to tell us that there were 40,000 ready for battle from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Why does it tell us that in this, in this moment? Why are they singled out? Well, that's because of Numbers 32. Numbers 32, verse 1. Now the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad had an exceedingly large number of livestock so that when they saw the land of Jezer in the land of Gilead, that it was indeed a suitable place for livestock, the sons of Gad and sons of Reuben came and spoke to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the leaders of the congregation. Verse 5, they said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us across the Jordan. But Moses said to the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben, Shall your brothers go to war while you sit you here? Now why are you discouraging the sons of Israel from crossing into the land which the Lord has given to them? This is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. For when they went up to the valley of Eshol and saw the land, they discouraged the sons of Israel so they did not go into the land which the Lord had given them. And so the Lord's anger burned against them from that day, and he swore none of the men who came up from Egypt from 20 years old upwards shall see the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They did not follow me fully, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun. They have followed the Lord fully. We go down to verse 20. Moses said to them, if you will do this, if you will arm yourselves before the Lord for war, and you and all your armed men cross to the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven his enemies out before him, the land is subdued before the Lord. Afterward, you shall return and be free of obligation toward the Lord of Israel, and this land shall be yours, a possession before the Lord. So what is happening here? They're, they're marching up, and then all of a sudden, you know, Moses is just approached by these leaders of these two tribes, and they say, this land is good enough for us. We don't want that inheritance in Israel. We'll just stay here on this side of the river. And Moses says, no, 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 no. That is the reason we didn't go in in the first place, that we wandered in the desert for 40 years. Don't tell everybody else that we can't go in, that we are not going to go in. We're going to go in because the Lord said we need to. And you don't exempt yourself now because we've come all this way. You are part of this. We are brothers. We are 12 tribes, not 10. We all go in or none of us go in. And we all need to go in. Because you're not going to sit here and be lazy while the other people go in and fight for their land and spill their blood. No, 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 no. You go with us. If you will promise to go with us and fight for the land, we will give you this right here. So go with us and, cu- and you can go back. 
and they agreed. Moses died, and sometimes when a leader is no longer in the position, they go, well, the promises of that leader are no longer valid. Forty thousand equipped for war from Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh crossed the river. They are faithful to their duty. They are faithful to their promise. And so this memorial stands as a sign. This scripture stands as a sign that they kept their promises. They did their duty. It's incredible. It's incredible to me. A third reason for memorials. We, we see that memorials exist for us to remember the past. Memorials exist to remember the duty. And memorials exist to help us move forward. What do I mean? Verse 17. Well, verse 16. All the way to 15. I'm getting messed up. Now the Lord said to Joshua, command the priests who carry the ark of the testimony that they will come up from the Jordan. And Joshua commanded the priests saying, come up from the Jordan. It came about when the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord come up from the middle of the Jordan, the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up to the dry ground, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and went over all its banks as before. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth of the first month, camped at Gilgal on the eastern edge of Jericho. The twelve stones which they had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. He said to the sons of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed. All that the peoples of the earth, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. It seems like he said the same thing, but he said something different. The people, the, the, they've crossed the river, and all of a sudden the priests step out onto what was normally the embankment, and all of a sudden the water comes back at flood stage almost instantaneously. It says they camped a few miles away from the river at Gilgal. We don't know exactly where Gilgal is, but it's just right outside Jericho. That's at least six miles away from the river. They're, they're not sitting right next to the river. They carried those stones a long way from the river, and then they laid it down. They built the memorial there. But what is happening? Why is he repeating this? talks about when your children ask their fathers in time to come so in the future we have moved from the past and we are now talking about the future when your children come you don't just teach them what this stone is you don't just teach them about what happened and the duty of what happened it says well, you shall inform them saying Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground for the Lord your God dries the water of you teach them that God is faithful that God was faithful here and now before the Lord your God dries up the waters of the Jordan. He was faithful back then with the Jordan. But then he goes back even further. God, what God had done at the Red Sea, he had piled it up just like at the Red Sea. And he uses a phrase that is used in the Exodus so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty. That is what God said that he would do to Egypt. I will put these plagues on Egypt so that all the world may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty. The whole planet is going to see that our God is mighty. And guess what? This memorial stone is remembering where he was mighty. When we disregard the heart and the purpose of a memorial, we disregard and dishonor the memory. If God was faithful in the past, he is present. He is faithful here now in the present and He will be in the future. We are not meant to just sit back and look at these memorials in the past and go, hey, that's great. Look at what they did. 
It's meant to get in us, drive us, and say, you know, if they did that, if God did that for them, then he can do that for me too. I can move forward with the knowledge that God is faithful back then, now, and in the future. I, it goes through my brain. What if these people just rolled up to the rivers of the Jordan and went, you know what? God split the Red Sea so that we could cross through it, so that our, our parents could cross through this. But, man, I wish he would just do that now. I, I wish he could do that for us. Oh, well. Turn around. Go home. No! He's still active. He's still doing things. He wants to know that when we, when we pass on this knowledge of a memorial of what God did, we are given the opportunity to pass this baton of knowledge on to the next generation, that God is faithful, that God is loving, that he keeps his promises. They got to talk about not just what that event is, but remember God's faithfulness, faithfulness throughout all of history. I want you to notice something that I have never seen before when I, I, before I, I really was looking at this. I want you to notice what the real memorial is here. Is it the stones? We might think that the memorial is the stones, but what are they really setting up? They're setting up their children to remember what God has done. And it clicked with me. Your children are the most important memorial you will ever, ha will ever have. Your children are the most important memorial you will ever have. It is said that within 150 years, people will, unless you are like really, really famous and put down in the history books, within 150 years, you will all be forgotten. We will all be forgotten. That's three, four generations. If you think about it, do you know off the top of your head your great, great grandparents? You might know their name. And so what Israel is doing here is they are saying, no, 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 no. We need to set this memorial up so that our children and our children's children and our children's 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 children will know that God is faithful and that we crossed here because he is good to us, that he loved us, that there was a promise for us. And because he did that back then, he can do that for us now. We need to remember our past. But if we stay in the past, we dishonor the memory of how they trusted God and this is all they were doing. The past informs our present and it informs our future. We can sit there and that the past is good, but if we sit there and we focus on it and we, we memorialize it and it doesn't move us and strike something in us and stir us up to move towards the future, we are dishonoring the memory of the whole reason they have set that memorial up in the first place. It's meant to cause us to think and move and act. And so this challenge for these memorials to keep us moving forward and trusting God, the question that rings in my head is, what have we forgotten? Because we can say we remember, but what have we forgotten? Have we settled for a memory rather than looking for or even begging God to do a new thing? Do we want him to do a new thing in this church? Do we want him to do a new thing in this community? Do we want to have our own stories that we can say, this is where God was faithful in my life. This is where God was faithful in my community. This is where he's faithful in my church right here, right now. Or are we always going to keep looking back and going, man, he did some great stuff back then. We want to have our own stories to tell now. And so the question, we, do we live for stories of nostalgia? Remember that time, man, I wish God would do that again. And this is my call this morning. It is time for us to make new memorials. What has God done for us now? What is God doing for us in our lives now? And what does a memorial look like? Well, we need current pictures of our active members serving in this church. At what point do we sit there and go, all right, this is what this church is doing out in the community, but we need a picture of it. We need to sit there and put it up so that the people in the future know that what we did. It, it's almost amazing that an entire generation or two generations can go by in the church, and yet we're nowhere on these walls. 
you are this church. You are this church. What do we want to be remembered and known for? What do we want this town to be remembered and known for? This church building turns 100 years old next year. But we want to do something big to commemorate it. We're looking for ideas. What do you want to do to commemorate that this building turns 100 years old? It would be a shame if that comes and goes without a memorial or without something worth a memorial being done that we can sit there and go, hey, guess what? We celebrated. We remembered. We did something. I would ask you, where are the memorials, not just corporately in the church, but where are the memorials in your life? We take pictures. A, a memorial of most people's lives is, is baptism. Do you remember the day you were baptized if you're a Christian? That is a memorial to your faith. It's also obedience to the, to, to the Lord. And so if you're not baptized and you want to be, come talk to me. What are these memorials that we set up? Take pictures, put them in your house and say, you know what? We went through 2020 and that was really, really hard. You know what? I'm going to make a memorial so that I remember that the Lord got me through it. It doesn't have to be something big. Just little reminders to ourselves that God is faithful. Back then, now, and in the future. We need to make new memorials. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. And Lord, we just pray that you would speak to us this morning. That we would honor those in Memorial Day that, that, that have died for our country. But Lord, we also want to honor the faithfulness that you have had upon us. May we never forget that you are with us here and now, the same God who led the Israelites out of Egypt, the same God who led them into Israel, who have done all these miracles, the same God who sent his son to die on the cross and resurrect under his own power for the salvation of us, all mankind, for all who would believe. You still do things for us here and now. And Lord, we want to never forget that you are with us now and always, even to the end of the age. May we remember you and may we honor you and may we look to the future knowing that you are still there. In your holy name we pray. Amen.